Bang ding ding, trademark. Ah, he come out. Six foot seven tall. Bang ding ding, one is tall. <laughs> everybody, welcome back to Eggs. This week's guest is David Hoffman. David is a serial entrepreneur with a long history of building multi-million dollar businesses. For more than 15 years, David has been working as CEO of Global Regency, where they ship more than $200 million in product to more than 40 countries every year. And he's widely considered to be an expert in Chinese sourcing, supply chain, private label, and brand licensing. Here to talk to us about living and working in China, as well as how to leverage Chinese manufacturing and sourcing in our own businesses. Join me in welcoming David Hoffman. Hey, David. Hey, Dave. How are you? Hey, Mark. Hey, Ryan. How are you doing? Not too bad. Very well. Thank you for making the uh, time to hop on with us. Yeah, appreciate it. So let's... Uh, Great. Thanks for having let's me. Let's dive right in. Let's talk about, you know, I mean, the the level of success that we're talking about in that little intro is pretty high bar. So let's talk a little bit about how we actually get there. So uh, tell us about your journey and, and how you, I guess, basically got to where we are today. Yeah, sure. Ryan, it's been very much, I wish I could say I had this mastermind plan. I didn't. Um, it was really a series of circumstances and events and opportunities that really led me here. Um, you know, I, I started off really just working in um, grocery stores, <laughs> earning part-time cash. Um, you know, worked, ended up, that kind of led me to a job at a big retail group that had just kind of started up on the rise back in South Africa. And it was really, you know, lucky that I'd taken that job because I just wanted to really pay study bills and study through correspondence. And I guess um, it was the taking of that job that really transformed my life because I was lucky to meet some mentors and business owners that were really on their acceleration up. And, um, you know, because I kind of had this, grit in me to work excessively hard. I was noticed and recognized. And, yeah, you know, it seems to work that way. That's where the journey started. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the journey really started there because I kind of was fortunate enough to grow with inside that company and learn a lot. And, you know, for me, I had nothing to lose. You know, it was all about financial gain then um, and paying the bills. And, you know, through that company, I managed to get the opportunity to come out to Hong Kong. Uh, Which you're, was you're from uh, Cape Town originally, is that? It's Johannesburg, Johannesburg, South Africa. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. I suppose we yes. should also mention, you know, Mike or uh, David is calling in from Hong Kong right now. So I mean, apparently things in yeah. Hong Kong worked out. Correct. So my grand plan was actually to come here for one year, and I was going to just you know set up a company here and reorganize a few things, and um, I and I was going to go on to Australia. Actually, that was always my dream. And 16 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> what what part of China are you in right now? So right now I'm in Hong Kong. Okay. Um, our offices are in Shenzhen, which is just across the border. So I travel in and out there quite a lot. And we do a lot of um, factory visiting all over, up north, east, west, everywhere. Yeah, and it seems that Shenzhen is one of those sort of central hubs where just about everything seems to be going on. Yeah, and it's so developed now, and it's just developing so quickly every day. It's becoming quite easy to get around there and make things happen. So, yeah. And, of course, being across the border from Hong Kong, it's so convenient for us. 
Yeah, no, of course. Um, well, so let's talk a little bit about that. Like, so as a, you know, person growing up in South Africa, how did you make the, de you know, the determination that China was where it's at? Was that just by way of these mentors that you'd met along the way? Or did you have it some was, other thing that took you into that country? It was completely by way of chance. An opportunity just presented itself where um, what actually happened was that company had a two-man office here in Hong Kong that I'd set up with the previous owner of that business that was sold. And um, that two-man business here was just not doing what it's supposed to do. The company back in South Africa was going through a whole variety of corporate changes and structural changes, which wasn't really very appealing to me. And, you know, then the opportunity came to come out here and reorganize that office, which I did. And as it happened, when I got out here, um, I ended up unbundling the office and, you know, running it as a standalone operation which wasn't expected. It was just kind of the way it all unfolded. Once I got here, I spoke to the people, understood what's happening, how things are working. And that's exactly what I did. And that was kind of my first start into spinning a business off into doing something on my own. Yeah. And, and a one year journey becomes a 16 year journey very quickly because as you get more and more involved, there's just a lot to do and a lot of opportunities, the side of the world. So you know, as you know, it's the hub for sourcing products and all these companies. So you just realize you don't need to be anywhere else at all. Every, every one thing here leads to another thing. So I never, ever thought when, when I was, when I was, you know, weighing up the options of coming out here and spending a year out here, I was kind of tossing it up saying, oh, it's the worst place I could imagine going. <laughs> and I never knew that it would turn around being like a place I actually love being in. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think there are a lot of uh, stereotypes and things like that, especially here in the United States, where, you know, we have sort of a view of China or a view of Hong Kong and places like that. And so it's, uh, I guess, interesting or refreshing to sort of hear, you know, your story and talk about it a little bit. How did you get into the sourcing uh, business? Was this the uh, the nature of the work you were doing for this company in South Africa? Or was this something you stumbled yes. on? Yes. Yes. So so we, we had a big electronics retail chain in South Africa. Um, and we were importing a lot of products from China. And, you know, I was involved quite heavily in that at the time. And so I, I'd already done quite a few trips out here um, sourcing. We used to use agents and things like that. In those days, we never really got to deal directly with manufacturers. Um, you're dealing with kind of agents, trading companies, and it wasn't as transparent as it is now. So you didn't never always knew who the factory was and who you were dealing with. So just coming out here on these trips, um, I kind of got to know the landscape and understand the landscape. And um, we were very fortunate that the company I was working with was part of a much larger group that was going through a restructuring. And you know that kind of led to the opportunity of really spinning this off as a separate business that could supply South Africa and also supply my business partner had moved to Australia and supply that company in Australia. You know, and that was kind of part of the grand plan to you know, establish the business in Australia, that I would eventually move there, um, which which changed over time. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's uh, it's interesting. I noticed as we were doing our research for this conversation uh, on on your little bio one sheet that I saw I saw several URLs for companies you're involved with in Australia. So uh, yes. I mean, it is I guess good news that uh, you know you're able to at least fulfill one little piece of that dream, even if you did, you know, opt not to live there, at least you still get to uh, do business there. Exactly. Well, I'll, I'll still end up there at some point. You know, I think what's been good about having the business here that we've, we've really used it as a backbone to start and found a lot of other companies, you know, around what we do here. So, you know, that's why you, you kind of see there's quite a few businesses I've either invested in or co-founded um, because, you know, it's just once you're an entrepreneur, you know, it's in your blood. So, you know, having this kind of backbone and infrastructure here has really enabled a lot of that. You know, that's one of the reasons, you know, you end up staying is because you're getting to fulfill all these things and do all these things as well anyway. Um, so I think that's really important that backbone's given us the ability to do these startups, start new businesses. Some have been great, some have been terrible, um, but it's all because we've had the infrastructure here that we've been able to do that. Can you talk about uh, the process of running a business in China? Um, I, I'm sure that it's a little bit different than, you know, in the States or in South Africa. Um, yeah. I, I know that uh, in the States we've, we've got, 
you know, we're taxed for this and that and, and, and everything. Is China similar? Do they, is it hard to start a business in China? Do you have to go and get a uh, LLC and all that stuff? Or is it just yes. the Wild West? You just do what you want. Yeah, so it's it's so there's two ways to do it. it. It is quite challenging. So there's Hong Kong and there's China, and we've got to like talk about them separately because Hong Kong is much easier than China um, because Hong Kong um, is based on British law. It's got a very advanced, established financial system and legal system. So Hong Kong, you can really come here. Um, there's two ways. You can either come on a work visa or you can come and open a business and get what you call an investment visa. And, I mean, you can buy a company in Hong Kong online in under 10 minutes. It's really not hard <laughs> in Hong Kong. And then those guys will introduce you to banks and you can get your bank account set up. So Hong Kong is a lot easier to set up a company and start doing business. Um, but if you want to come stay here and live here under a visa, under that company, it's got to be a certain amount of investment or a business plan um, that shows a certain amount of turnover over a two-year plan that will justify them granting you an investment visa. Otherwise, you've got to work towards it. Hmm. China is a little bit different because it's actually, you know, they run one country, two systems. So with China, you you'd have to have, you actually have to have a separate company, um, which is a little bit harder to do because of the language barriers and um, things like that, but it's doable. It's doable in certain zones, like areas like Shanghai, Shenzhen. It's a lot easier f- to open a foreign-owned company, um, but you do want you do need to employ some people there, and the banking's not as efficient and easy. So what a lot of companies really do is they open up in Hong Kong, and then they have like a representative office in China, and they travel in and out. Oh, so that's okay. normally the the, the st- that's normally the easiest way to do it. Um, just and mostly because of the financial system. You know, the banks in Hong Kong are very normal and easy to operate. In China, it's a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy. Even the online banking is all in Chinese. So <laughs> unless you speak a bit of Chinese, read a bit of Chinese, it's challenging unless you get a Chinese partner. So I'm assuming after 16 years, you're pretty good at the language. How long did it take before you kind of felt comfortable with that or do you just don't? Mark, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you've hit you've hit my sore point and it's like i don't speak I'm, a word <laughs> not a word not a word and i feel terrible about it and <laughs> i get reminded every day somehow <laughs> sorry <laughs> they tell me i've got the world record the only guy who can live here 16 years and not say a word <laughs> yeah. yeah no but I, I have a retaliation for it i have a oh. retaliation for it and that is Sometimes you don't want to know those details. You just want to know the end result. Too many, <laughs> if you understand everything, you listen to too many excuses. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably better not to hear what they're saying about you anyway and all that stuff. So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, so can you talk about it? You, you started to get into it a little bit with sort of startups and things like that. But, you know, especially now, there's so many you know, young startups coming up that are trying to roll out new products, services, things like that. And, you know, one of the obvious steps is a lot of people start looking to China to source materials and, and products. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that process and just sort of your perspective on, you know, starting the process of cre- of creating a product in China and so maybe some of the risks and things to avoid? Sure. So I think, you know, it's it's something that I'm, quite, I'm passionate about because we started most of our businesses around finding products in China. And um, we, we now work with famous brands. We license some famous brands. But, you know, before all of that, it literally started with coming to China, going to trade shows, which is something I highly recommend people do is just visiting trade shows here to find products and literally just finding products that are interesting and that we think we can sell. And then we, you know, we start importing them, selling them, whether it's in bricks and mortar or online. You know, the selling channel itself is a whole separate discussion. I know most people think, oh, Amazon, you know, e-commerce. It's, 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 of course, a huge selling channels, but they're not the only selling channels. But I just find coming to China and finding products at trade shows and finding interesting opportunities. There's almost no, I can tell you every trade show I go to, I'm not sure what I'm looking for. And I leave there with just like so many ideas and opportunities. I don't even know where to start. But I think the key, some of the things to kind of be aware of is just, you know, it's the follow-up and communication afterwards with the manufacturers or the suppliers and 
you know, the, making sure you're going through the right process of dealing with them, not paying them prematurely, um, checking the quality is okay, checking the manufacturing facilities, getting all the samples in. There's a lot of little things you need to do because if, you know, what you can't do is just go find a supplier, they present a product to you and think, okay, I'm going to pay for it and I'm going to ship it perfectly. It never happens. There's a lot of detail in between. And that's because you're dealing with manufacturers who are very used to customizing orders and every detail of the order really to what you want and what you need and to even reach a certain price point that you want and need. So, you know, it's not like kind of going and buying a branded product, you know, like maybe you're going to buy a JBL product. You don't have to think about any of that, right? It's done for you. Whereas you're sourcing from China, you've got to think about every detail from packaging, design, to how they're going to make it, to what checks to do in terms of quality before it leaves the factory. Is a factory stable? Are they going to run away with your money? Are they going to do a good job? You know, there's a lot to think about. Yeah. Is there, is it, I mean, is there any, say, for example, you go to order, you know, widget A and you're down the process and they do run away with your money, you pretty much just SOL. Is there no way you can... I, I mean, Ryan's dealt with a client before in the past where uh, she sent some product over to get made, and then all of a sudden she saw the counterfeit knockoff version of it being sold at, yeah. elsewhere. Is there any way to avoid yeah. that kind of stuff, or is it just part of the deal? Yeah, there are ways to avoid it. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a part of the deal in that you can't think it's never going to happen to you, and it's not a reality. It is a reality, and you've got to be aware of it. It's happened to me loads of times, by the way. I've had my products ripped off, I've had my brands ripped off, um, and I've lost tens of thousands of dollars in deposits that factories just won't give back to me. Um, but you can you can mitigate those risk, risks. And the, the things we do now is we always visit the factories and do site visits to just kind of check their size and scale and infrastructure, because I think that's really important. They're not going to be disappearing. Um, we've we do some background checks on their companies now, you know, to make sure they're financially stable, that they're proper registered companies and who their legal representatives are. We now sign contracts. We actually call it a TT contract, which is before we make any payment transfers to them, um, we make them sign the terms and conditions of those deposits and what events they've got to give it back to us. Um, we make sure the legal rep will sign that. Now, to be honest, those contracts are very enforceable in China, but very costly to enforce and time consuming to enforce. So it's not that I think they're a miracle solution, but they're a deterrent. And what I've found is a lot of factories don't want to sign it or refuse to sign it or refuse to get the official legal rep to sign it. And that I just kind of take as the stress test in itself. Well, if they don't want the right person to sign it, it's not even getting involved from the beginning. So we do that. Um, and, um, you know, we, 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 w one thing we do as well, which is something I'll recommend to everybody is, um, register your trademark in China. doesn't matter if you've got a trademark in a, in the U S or an international trademark or anywhere else, get it registered in China. It's the cheapest thing to do. It's a couple of hundred dollars. And, um, once you, you know, and I'll tell you why I say that, you know, we, I've had guys that with big brands they're selling in the US online and their manufacturers actually gone and registered their trademark in China. So what happened is they find their product selling um, on um, Amazon in China or on Taobao in China or JD.com in China, which are all the big e-commerce sites. And it's their brand, it's their product and everything. And, you know, as we've investigated, it turns out that the way China works is it's the first to register their trademark in China owns it. So there's a lot of what we call brand squats. I actually do a whole training session on this with people. That's why I, like, I, I, I talk about it so much. Is um, There's brand squatters, brand hijackers that actually look for popular brands online or even not online. Um, and they just register them in China in the hope that somebody will come and offer them money for it. Or in the hope that they're going to dovetail in China domestic market on you know the laurels of that brand. You know mm. they've got reviews online. They can be found online on search. So, so it's quite messy. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, it, it's almost like uh, buying a domain and sitting on the domain so you can resell it to the guy that wants it later. But um, what I was going to say, worse, exactly what it's like. Yeah. So I, I was listening to a podcast the other day. Uh, I think it was like the Jordan Harbinger show or something. But uh, he he was talking about. Um, 
companies that will do something similar like that, like take a, a brand that's doing really well, and then they'll throw it on and start selling it in the, in the States, like the yep. same, you know, Nike shoe or whatever, and, and then they they send it through Amazon, and, and the, the people will get the, the Chinese replica, uh, the, the knockoff version, and it won't be as yes. quality as what they are, and they'll leave bad reviews on the actual clients that operate in the states and so it's actually affecting the the businesses that are operating in the states with the actual product because people are thinking that's what they're getting and it's not and so is there exactly is there any yeah. way i mean it just seems like a really kind of weird scenario and and <laughs> how do you combat that how do you deal with that yeah, it's it's very challenging. I think the only way it's a and it isn't a one answer that solves everything. That I think it's a number of things you have to do, which is to be diligent about your business. I think the first and foremost registering your trademark because if you don't own the trademark, um, it's very hard to take any action. Sure. And why I say register it in China, even if you have an international mark or a U.S. mark, because you know, lawyers will tell you, oh, you've got one year to register in other countries under the Geneva Convention and things like that in the WTO. Yes, you do, but it's like, what, two, 300 bucks to register in China and you get a certificate. You're the first one to register it immediately. You don't have to go through any um, litigation or any contest arguments to get it back if you find somebody doing it. So even though, yes, you have the right, it's going to, I mean, we've, we're dealing with the case right now I think we must have spent seven or eight thousand dollars already um, on legal fees dealing with it, and we got we right and we're going to win. But for two three hundred bucks, I could have just registered the trademark anyway up front and saved all that aggravation, so yeah. it wouldn't be worth it. Well, so, I, so like, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say I've heard that the um, uh, intellectual property rights are. are beginning to be more enforced or more enforceable in China than they have been in the past. So I think a lot of people, you know, or at least the stereotypes are based on sort of old experience, you know, like, I mean, Mike Mike mentioned the case of my client. She used to do like rotom molding, silicon rotom molding over there. And, uh, and yeah, and her products were basically being resold by the company that was making them. And she did several, um, you know, rounds of lawsuits and things like that. But in those days, you know, this was almost 20 years ago now. Um, you know, there was not a lot she could do in terms of intellectual protection or intellectual rights protection. So, but it seems like China is coming around on that one a little bit. Exactly. You've actually hit the nail on the head. There's that misconception that, um, you can't do anything about it in China and there's just no recourse. And, and I mean, I've, I've successfully proven firsthand there a hundred percent is recourse, but you've got to have your stuff done properly and registered properly. If you've got a Chinese registered trademark, for example, and you go and, and somebody's selling it online in China, you can get it taken down within a day. There's not even a question. It's, mm. you know, the, the, the AI is good now. They, they respect intellectual property a lot more. Um, there's a system to get that done. If you've got an international trademark and somebody's selling it online in China, you go try to get that taken down. The lawyer is going to want to translate it into Chinese. They're going to want to check if anyone else in China has already registered it prior to you. It's going to take what can take you a couple of days will take you six months at best, you know, to deal with. And that's why I say if you just learn these little shortcuts, it's very helpful. And for sure, um, you know, it, it's, I feel like it's one of those things that you look back and say, oh, I should have just done that. You know, it's like you start a business, you tackle an insurance policy, you register your trademark in China. I'm just, <laughs> I'm a massive believer in it. <laughs> well, it seems like um, a good idea. And yeah, I mean, I think as easily, you know, especially if you are sourcing product out of China and which I suppose, you know, it adds to the risk of somebody taking your product, uh, you know, it would make perfect sense to kind of get out ahead of that, do a little preventative maintenance by, by exactly. registering first. And so, if you're buying volume and selling well, you know, the manufacturers know and that because they're producing it. So they're still saying, oh, this is successful. They'll go online and check out what you're doing, what you're selling, why it's doing great. And, you know, that, that, there's a lot of entrepreneurial people in China too. And if they go, well, oh, it's not registered in China, let me do it in China. It's their world. Like the U.S. is your world, <laughs> China's yeah. their world. They don't. They don't even see a problem with it, to be honest. They don't think they're actually being malicious. I think they're being entrepreneurs. I think. I think what happens is when they start to try 
and sell that same product in the States or in the UK or yeah, in absolutely. other markets, that's where the product comes in. You know, because if, if they're selling it all in China and it's a hit there, I'm not going to do anything. You know, it's not, I've, yeah. I don't really care. Well, you but, will when people can start buying online in China and having it shipped to the US um, and, and they start seeing the same product on other selling channels. But you're right. When it is different, when they're selling in the U.S., it, of course, it's ten times worse, and your U.S. trademark needs to protect you there or patent if it's a patented product. Um, but it's just a case of how do you find the source of where that kind of um, challenge is coming through. And one of the things I say is like, if, if you do have your trademark in China and your trademark in the U.S. It is becoming more and more difficult. And I'm, I'm a big believer, and that's why I say get it done now, because you're the first to register owns that trademark in China. Because what I'm seeing happening with the development of AI and even just the, the whole um, the way government systems are run in China, I think the next few, few years it's 100% automated and it's 100% AI driven. And every single shipment that goes out of China, the bill of ladings, the brand names that are registered on those documents, AI is going to pick it up in two seconds, and you know, and, and see who the who the certified owners and authorized imports and exporters are of those brands. I think the only reason it's so s slow now is just because of some of the paperwork and administration behind some of these things, and I've seen that change in China so rapidly, it's just frightening. I, I went to the business registration department the other day in Shenzhen, which five years ago was like kind of walking to a third world country, chaotic place um, where no one knew what was going on and it was just chaos. And it looks like an Apple store now. It's a mm. government bureau. <laughs> it looks like an Apple store. We didn't even have to go stand in a line or a counter. We sat on comfortable couches because when you walk in, you scan with WeChat. You just scan the QR code, put your name, and they say, please wait, we'll be with you in 10 minutes, take a seat, we'll see you at counter five. And you just sit there, it's so advanced and, and quick and everything's facial recognition. There's no paperwork almost. So Can, can you actually, I, you know, I, this is a sidetrack here, but uh, yeah. coming from South Africa and, and being there in, in China, does that bother you at all, the facial recognition and the, the government overlord kind of thing there? Or, or is it just second... <laughs> You know, you know, it is what it is. You just deal with it now. Yeah, I think it it is what it is. Just stay out of trouble. Stay clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and make sure you're never on somebody's wanted list. <laughs> um, you know, there's so many efficiencies that come with it, to be honest. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, when you can just do things and it's effortless and you don't have to fill up paperwork and stuff, it's, it's kind of nice. But, yeah, that privacy issue and big brother issue, I don't think we're going to beat that. Yeah. Just, uh, I don't want to be the doom and gloom of it. But I just think <laughs> stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble and enjoy the benefits, I guess. Yeah. Do you uh, do you foresee that becoming commonplace pretty much worldwide, or do you think that's something that's just going to be stuck to China? I think it's going to be commonplace worldwide. And yeah. I think China is going to be so far ahead of everybody else. I think people don't realize yet just how advanced China is in that space. And so, they're kind of rebuilding from the inside out. So sometimes there's some surface level or physical inefficiencies people see around them and go, oh, this is still third world. But they're rebuilding inside out. And I think they, you're going to open your eyes one day and go, what just happened here? Yeah, they, they were. How did uh, this happen? I've heard that it, it's almost to the point where you can walk out to the street and say, I want an Uber. It'll scan your face, charge it to your account, yeah. and the car will show up. Not even have exactly. a phone or anything. Uh, it's just kind of crazy. It's so advanced. In Shenzhen now, like the guards will tell you, you don't, don't even worry about losing something. Like every street's got a camera, they can find anything instantly. It's like, it's like kind of the rumor, you know, when people talk socially, they go, you, I, I don't care, I can leave my phone here because. If I lose it, somebody's gonna they're gonna tell me who took it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that is a, a perk, but it's still kind of yeah. weird. Uh, we're just not used to it, I guess. Um, exactly. So let's get back on topic, I guess. Um, say, for example, I had a product that I wanted to get manufactured in China. Would I call someone like you and say, "Hey, what do I need to do?" And you're like a consultant consultant for me, or is that what your business is? Or um, 
Yeah, so, so there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, of course, we love it if people call us to help because that is our business or it's one of our businesses. So, of course, we love that route. I'll explain a bit more about it. Um, but, you know, there's multiple ways to do it, to be fair. You can hop online to, you know, the usual websites like Alibaba, um, China Source, Made in China, Global Sources. And you can do a lot of the initial homework and research on your own. Um, you know, sourcing a product out of China and developing a product is a lot of homework. And it's not a, it's not a quick, there's no quick fix to it. So I say to people, do a lot of homework first. You know, you can contact manufacturers and suppliers. You can get quotes. You can learn a lot about what you want to do, see who's willing to do what for you. And you can do a lot of that homework on your own. The other way is you can hop on a plane, come to China, visit them, um, visit trade shows, and go deeper and work with the manufacturers. We've done that a lot. Um, if you come to guys like us, what we do for you is um, we we kind of – um, fast track a lot of those things, I guess, because what happens is like we do a sourcing project for a client, you know, um, of course they pay us and then they get an account manager in China, in our Shenzhen office who will find the manufacturers for them, get the quotations for them and commute and really be almost be like a VA on the ground in China, but with a lot of experience and, you know, with a team of people around them, because we've got quality engineers, we've got compliance engineers, we've got shipping experts, you know, we've got a whole lot of people that kind of make the pieces of the puzzle fit. But that doesn't negate a lot of the time and effort that has to go into it, right? It just shortens it and takes a lot of that burden off you because you've got somebody to help you on the ground. If you need to visit the factories, we can visit the factories, give you opinions and views on them. So... Um, there's different ways to get it done, but what I say to everybody is it's like homework, homework, homework. It's a process, and you've got to get all the samples arranged and check it. So um, whether you, you know, it's it's a process. And I think the process is finding manufacturers, getting quotes, then sampling and getting through all the samples and checking them, and then doing it. Probably going to two or three iterations of that. And then at some point, you know, you want to validate the supplier and just make sure if you, when you've got a short list of suppliers, you know, who are the best ones you want to deal with. You know, and that's measured in a couple of ways from communicating with them to possibly visiting them. I don't think you have to visit every manufacturer. I think you can, you can outsource that or you can sometimes forego it if you felt you've had a very smooth run with the supplier. But generally, I visit every manufacturer we deal with. Interesting. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a process. Um, well, so speaking to that, like maybe um, let's take like a little bit of a step back. We started talking about startups a little bit and maybe getting into the world of working in China. I guess do you have any sort of set criteria or like sort of a I don't know an idea for for when would be the appropriate time to look at engaging in China? I mean, like you said, a lot of it's homework. So, I mean, I suppose while you're doing this homework, you could assess, you know, the ability of an American plant or a, you know, so, you know Canadian plant or whatever to do your project yes. at the same time, you know, weigh the pros and cons against a Chinese company. But when do you think is the yes. right time to start that process or when should one, you know, start looking at China as an option? What are the positives versus the negatives? So I think that the, the, the positives is you normally get lower manufacturing prices. I think that's the real positive. The negative is it's just a lot harder and you've got to be a lot more involved because a lot more can go wrong. Not to scare anybody off at all. I think you should be looking at China because your manufacturing costs are so much lower. And at the end of the day, um, you need to have the margin. But I also think what matters is the volume you're doing. I think if you're still doing small volumes, um, it might be better just to do it locally or do it, you know, onshore instead of offshore somewhere like China because typically the manufacturers here do want a higher order run and what we call MOQ, minimum order quantity. Um, you know, with the minimum order quantities, I think I'm finding more and more manufacturers here will do smaller volumes, especially if you're willing to pay a bit of a surcharge, which can still be lower um, than um, what you might be paying locally for a product. So I I think the biggest thing is step one for me in assessing China as a viable thing is you've got to start the sourcing project, right? And you've got to do that homework. 
because by doing that homework, you're going to find out what manufacturers are out there, what their capability is, the types of prices they're charging. And, you know, I like I say to people, like when we start a sourcing project, I sometimes say, sometimes the sourcing project doesn't give you the answer you want where you say, oh, I found the greatest product at the best price and, you know, we're going to kill it with this. Sometimes the project tells you don't touch China or um, we can't actually get to the right pricing on this no matter what we do. So let's kill the product altogether or let's not go this route. And that's why I say, you know, the, I mean, we've dropped loads of products that we just eventually decide now we can't get to the right price or we can't get the right quality we want or we just can't get the right specs we need to make the difference. So we just drop it. And you go, wow, you spent like six months working on this project and you just dropped it. I go, yeah, because I don't want to spend the next two years regretting it, losing money. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you me- you mentioned, you know, that there's room for things to go wrong in China. Do you think, is it actually more, like, I guess, are there more things to go wrong than might happen working with a, a local plant? Or do you think it's like language barrier, things like that, that are presenting the issues? I think, no, I think there is more to go wrong. Um, language barrier is a massive cause of that, 100% correct, misunderstandings. Um, I think distance makes another challenge because, just sampling and trying to articulate and explain certain needs makes a big difference. And I think generally there is a big mindset difference in terms of quality between yeah. China and Western countries. And it's, and it's not an intentional, deliberate thing where they're necessarily trying to take a shortcut to make it cheaper. Um, it, it's a mindset, right? It's how you use a product. They might not even use those products or see the need for making it better. Um, and I, that mindset of quality, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. And that's why like, one of the things I look at when I'm talking to factories is to try to see what their mindset and view of quality is. Because they're quite a pleasing culture in China. And, you know, if you say to somebody, oh, I want to buy this at $5, and they can find a way to make it at $5 for you, they will. And to be fair to them, um, they've achieved what you've asked for, right? Sure. What you may not realize is that, oh, but did they volunteer to tell you they're using a lower grade material or they're using a cheaper zipper or they doing something different, right? Yeah. So they, their goal is to satisfy your request, which is admirable and great, but not at the cost of quality. And you assume that they'll tell you, okay, well, to do that, I'm going to use a cheaper zipper. I'm going to do something differently. Um you can't assume that. And that's where that mindset is different, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So it's a, you know, not just language, but maybe cultural differences that actually lead to some of these complications. Exactly. Cultural and mindset. Yeah, yeah. I think that makes sense. I, I once did work, uh, I, my company works in the advertising, marketing design space. And, and on occasion, I'll have the, the opportunity to illustrate books for people. And I did a book for a guy and uh, he decided to do his printing in China. And that was one of the problems he'd run into is he was trying to get them to reach a certain price point but the part they left off was that in order to make it so cheap they had to use a lead-based ink and so when they did so you know which was perfectly compliant in china when it arrived on the shores in the u.s and they tested it for lead you know the whole batch of books had to be scrapped basically they were weren't allowed into the country and so and it was you know cost savings they weren't like you said it's not a, a a matter of being malicious he said hey i don't want to pay a dime more than x for that book and the only way they could do it is with some old, outdated lead-based ink, you know? Exactly. And, and, and to your point, a local manufacturer would know that, oh, that's not compliant in the U.S. because they're just used to the regulatory requirements in, that, in, the, in their home country. Whereas in China, the manufacturers don't necessarily know the regulatory and compliance requirements, you know, other countries have. Yeah, I guess and the, the, the like onus is on the to... person who sent over the order. I guess it's on them exactly. to know and that it really order is. is correct. Yeah, and a lot of amateurs make the mistake of thinking, oh, but the manufacturer should take care of that and know that because they're shipping to their country. And like that's one of the big mindset changes of the buyers that I talk to them all the time. I say, no. I said, once you're importing from China, every single thing is your responsibility because it's your brand, it's your product, it's your reputation. You you got to you got to find out the regulatory requirements. You got to find out what that's going to cost. Yeah, and it makes sense because ultimately it's going to show up on the shores here. Yeah, and, but and if they don't allow it to come in, then 
It's but kind of on you. Exactly. In, in the example that you just shared with the lead-based ink, I mean, like, I wouldn't have even thought to think that there could be a lead-based ink and that, like, they'd print it and it wouldn't. Yeah. Well, and wouldn't. I guess that just goes back to this homework element, right? Yeah. I mean, like, I, I don't know how you would have found that out. And, I mean, ultimately, maybe he didn't have the best manufacturer who wasn't transparent with him or something. I, I don't know the whole situation. But, um, but I can see how him not having an understanding or... You know, and I, I imagine this happens a lot, too, where like maybe an American buyer kind of, I don't know, bullies the Chinese manufacturer and says, hey, man, I know you can do it cheaper, you know, make it cheaper, blah, 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 you know, because everybody's trying to save that buck. And, you know, maybe almost even pressured them into making a decision that is suboptimal. Exactly. It, it happens all the time. And, and, and that's true. They do get bullied into that. And, um, you know, there are ways to find out what regulatory and compliance there is and that's why i say the detail and homework of sourcing from china is really important um you know like we've got a compliance team that literally all they do every day is um you know speak to labs speak to regulatory authorities to find out what we need to be aware of and we build protocols for these products as we develop them because you know everything whether it's garments or consumer electronics um, or even plastics and rubber materials, there's always standards. Now, if you talk to labs, they'll tell you. You don't actually have to guess. If you ask a manufacturer, some of them will say, oh, we've got this certification or this approval, and they may have it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100% correct for your market. You need to check independently with the labs and you know, with compliance people. Um, and the other important thing what we've learned over the years is – because we ship a lot of electrical product, which is quite challenging for safety because it plugs into a wall socket mm -hmm. and it's very easy to have fires and safety hazards, is even if a factory's got the, um, the certification and the approval, it doesn't mean, because they, they might have done it on last year's production for another client, it doesn't mean when they're making your product, they're going to use the same materials, the same components and the same standards and if they don't it doesn't their certificate is not valid for your production and so when it's a very high risk product um, sometimes we will take samples off the production line and do what we call verification tests we'll go to like a certified or an accredited lab in china and we'll say can you check that this is the fire resistant material and it, there's always tests for those things so depending on how critical it is to safety and you know how big your volume runs are there's a lot you can do to mitigate that risk but you need to be knowing what to do and working with somebody that can help you through that whereas domestically you know with the local manufacturer in the us you probably don't have to worry about most of that because they're obliged to take care of all of it as a as a domestic manufacturer interesting yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, so let's take just a little bit of a, a tangent. We, you know, I think we've done a, a good job covering some of the the benefits and, and things to do with China. I'd like to pick your brain a little bit more about sort of your entrepreneurial journey and a little bit more mm. about sort of this ability to do business across the globe. So as I'm looking, yeah. you know, again, at this list of businesses that you're involved with, you know, we've got these Australian companies, I see an Indian company. Um, I see, you know, a number of different uh, verticals, you know, we've got carbonated soda, we've got apparel, we've got baby products, we've got all these different things. Uh, how do you, you know, I guess, first of all, how did you get into sort of an entrepreneurial life? We talked about you came up through that, but I mean, was it, were you always entrepreneurial in the work you were doing? Or, or again, were these all just kind of happy accidents? And then besides that, you know, how do you, I guess, decide when and where to work on something? I, presumably, there are opportunities that are showing up from, you know, different relationships you've made over time. But to do so yes. many things across the planet, I, I'm just curious how it all sort of works and how it works yes. toward, sort of towards your, your end. Yeah, and that's really good questions. Um, so, yes, I have always been entrepreneurial. Um, I, I also have a business partner who was my mentor, in previous years, we became business partners later, who's also extremely entrepreneurial. So I was lucky to have a very entrepreneurial mentor. So I kind of got into that mindset. And just by nature, I was always entrepreneurial. Um, it was always important for me to be successful um, financially, not because I love money or anything like that. It was because of, I just felt, you know, financial freedom is very important. And it gives you the freedom to do things that you care about and things that you're passionate about. And that's really what it's about for me. But it's always it always has been in my blood. 
But I think when I got to um, Hong Kong and China and the business developed here, um, exactly what happened is, um, is, is, is what you said. Opportunities presented themselves, right? You meet a lot of people, you find a lot of product, um, and being entrepreneurial, you know, so many things, you know, present themselves. And, you know, they always start out as just kind of a seed of an idea and a discussion. There's probably five or six seeds going on right now that, you know, me and my partner are talking about and we discuss and we go, oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Or somebody told me about this. Do you like the idea? And we, we, we it, toss it around. And what we find happens is over like a three, four, five week period, when we end up just talking about it more and more and more, and it just starts, it's almost like a seed that gets watered. And, you know, we talk to people around us about it. You know, do you like this? Do you like that? And we almost start with no preconception. But if we find a couple of weeks later, it's growing and escalating and, you know, we're talking about it more often and people are liking it as we bounce it off them. We start taking it more and more seriously. Um, but, and then it eventually just comes to a tipping point where we say, okay, yeah, we're doing this. Let's start it up. But every single thing we started, we start small. We really start with, well, let's, what's, what's the minimum way we can test this out? What's the minimum thing we can do to, to see that this is workable? We never, ever, ever, um, go and say, oh, let's pour a whole pile of money into this business idea and 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 see if we can make it work and raise money. We never do that. We start off with, we every single thing we do, we start off as if we're starting from a, a garage and it's got to grow on its own. It's just kind of a rule of thumb we have now. Yeah, no, that's really cool though. One thing that you mentioned sort of in that process that I think is kind of refreshing or cool to hear from an entrepreneur is this sort of uh, being able to trust your gut, right? You guys, you guys. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you ask around and you get other people's vibes and things like that, but you're not breaking it down to a spreadsheet before you get going. You're, you're testing it. Never. You know, it sounded good to yeah. us. Does it sound good to you? Well, cool, then let's do it, you know? And I love that idea of being exactly. able to trust yourself to make those kinds of decisions. Yeah. I can tell you when we, we do, I don't, I, I'm not saying this is right. So don't <laughs> take, I'm just saying it's, it's the truth is I, I think we do a spreadsheet a year after we started a business. We just don't do it because we so engage in every little expense. If, we, we, we take a piece of paper and we just scribble what we think we could do. And, you know, if we can't explain it to ourselves in under a minute on a scribbled piece of paper, um, I don't think a, a spreadsheet's going to change our mind. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, it just it it, it feels yeah. kind of loose, and I think especially nowadays, it, you know, so many people, I guess, have different entrepreneurs and things as mentors or as heroes. You know, that they're sort of modeling their things after. And I think through the allure of of social media and other platforms that make things look like they happen very quickly. I think people yeah. tend to get real analytical, real analytical, real fast, and are looking for a quick solution versus you know trusting their gut or doing what they think is right. Instead, you know yeah. they're they're busy doing what they think might be right for somebody else. And so I, I think exactly. I, I think that's what I think is so refreshing about that the way you described your process. Yeah, and one of the things I find also is like you know sometimes you got an idea and you think it's a really good idea, and we're very aware of the fact that. You know, how you execute that idea matters. Um, and, you know, the same idea, I might fail at one idea and the exact same idea somebody else might be successful at it. And it's purely because of execution, right, the way they did it. And something we've always been realistic about is trying to understand what we're good at and what we're not good at. And sometimes we'll start something and go, you know what, but do we really know how to do this? Um, and, you know, by the way, like a big part of, for example, in the digital online space, you know, digital marketing is, is a whole world unto its own, right? And, um, you know, one of the businesses we said, well, this is like a lot of digital marketing. Do we know how to do that? Do we know how to do that really well? And we concluded we don't. So what we said was, well, let's see if in six months we can learn as much as possible. Let's see if we can find people that can help us with this. And if we find along the way we've built a team or we've got found access to certain resources that can can make this happen, you know, we'll continue with it. But often we get to go, oh, you know what? Hands up in the air, we can't do this. We're not good enough. We know there's people out there that are great at it and can do it, but we, we don't have access to them right now. Yeah. Um, and we just go, we, we don't know how to do it. Uh, that's cool. No, I mean, again, I just, I think I like the honesty of that, you know, I mean, being like looking at yourself, understanding what you're actually good at versus not, 
and uh, and making decisions based on that. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. So and I think that's really a key part of the entrepreneurial journey. It's like a lot of things you do and you double down on them because you found the right people in that space. And you, you go like, actually, because I've got this person, I'm going to do that because I know we can do that. And I know we can do that. And I know we can do that. And sometimes you find somebody who you meet and you go, oh, they're like super talented at something. You go, oh, wow. Okay, well, you know what? I had this idea, but now that I've met you, let's talk. Can we maybe do this? Or can we make this happen? So it's very much as the idea as much as is knowing who and how to execute. And they go hand in hand. Sometimes sometimes that one comes before the other. There's no order. Sometimes the, you meet a person that motivates you to do something, or sometimes you have an idea that motivates you to find the person. It's a push and a pull sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. So in the electronics world, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, different uh, manufacturers and suppliers out there. Um, <clears throat> do you ever run into issues where you get a product that looks good but doesn't function correctly, and then you, you're going through the testing process and you figure out, oh, this isn't going to work in the States, and you're down the, the pipeline too far to actually kind of make changes? Do you just ship it somewhere else or what? Like, um, like yesterday that happened. <laughs> God, Mike, you were, you were hitting on a number of sore spots. Today. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so, I mean, like that, that's got it. Cause you're, you're down the, you've got the product kind of in hand, almost done. And you realize, Oh crap, this isn't going to work in this market. Do you just kind of change and yeah. pivot markets? Yeah. That might be why I thought I'd be here for a year and I'm still here for six years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, look, the, the name of the game is to front load everything at the beginning before you place the order to avoid that happening, right? That's the utopia we're looking for. Is there it, kind of like a central place, uh, checks and balances that you can say, okay, this is what we need for the States. This is what we need for Mexico. This is what we need for Canada. Is there like well, a, a place you can go to figure that all out? Or is it just kind of you got to call your local it's, representative? It, it, it's research. What we do is we build what we call an order bomb. It's just a, a term we phrase. An order bomb is like a bill of materials for your order where we say, okay, we, we create a checklist protocol for every single product and it's divided into major categories, packaging and labeling, um, regulatory and compliance, um, features, which is the actual product features. Um, and then, you know, commercial um, terms and conditions and things like that. So there's, I think there's 11 different categories we break this order bomb down into and every single product we do, we've got to go through every single area, and we've got different people that work on it. And, and the other one's um, quality control, which is what are we going to check and test after production? What are we going to check and test during production and things like that? And we build this order bomb checklist of everything. And then we don't ship a product until that whole check. We've got it online, actually. We don't ship a product until that whole checklist is closed off and verified and checked and tested. Okay. Having said that, we still make mistakes where – um, we check the product at the factory before it leaves and we check everything before it leaves. Um, maybe they've done a bad quality job printing the um, gift box. You know, we, it's exactly the case we had yesterday. The gift box came out so badly. It's, it's just terrible. I mean, you don't, you wouldn't want that box to get into the hands of a consumer. And we go, what did we do wrong? And when I went back, yes, somebody didn't put in the right spec for the box, didn't actually put in a spec. They put in the artwork and the colors and the dimensions but they didn't say what material to use. They didn't say what coating to use, which is an error they should have. But it's like little details like that that matter. So anyway, we, we're biting the bullet and we um, paying for new boxes and we're having the factory repackage it because it's still cheaper to do it here in China. And it's probably going to add 3 $4 onto the cost of the product for us. But we just don't feel like we have a choice because I think the choice of not doing it, it would be a disaster. We have loads of cases where we test a product um, after production and it doesn't pass the drop test and the factory made a mistake or they used the wrong material or the wrong component. And yeah, we have to make a call. Do we rework it at the factory or um, do we think we can make what we call a commercial release, which means, okay, the, the, the risk is low, you know, the, the, the time or the cost or the damage even of reworking 
you know, doesn't outweigh it, um, you know, is not outweighed by the risk. And we'd make a commercial decision if we think it's safe to ship or not ship. Um, and sometimes we've just had to completely scrap goods um, and negotiate some settlement with the factory. I mean, those are extreme cases, um, but they do happen. I must say they happen a lot less now. I find now what happens mostly is because we don't make that many mistakes on compliance anymore because we've got a really strong team and we're really good at that. Um, I find mostly it's, it's a little careless mistakes at the factory where mm. oh, they just printed it wrong or they didn't pass the right instructions through to their production line. And it's like annoying things like that where we just work through and we try to be as commercial as possible about it. I think, you know, like what I also value is you've got to have a good relationship with your manufacturer. So, you know, if there's a small mistake, that's really not going to commercially affect the product. Sometimes it's better just to let it go and say, look, we're not happy about this. It can't happen again because you want them to feel like they can work with you. You don't want them to be the factory that's registering your trademark, supplying your competition, drilling you into the ground every opportunity they get. So you do have to have a very open-minded commercial outlook on it. But at the same time, you're going to make the right calls and, you know, in China before it ships. Well, and it makes sense that you should have, you know, a good relationship with your manufacturers. You know, they're going to feel more compelled to do good work for you. Uh, exactly. All those sorts of things, you know, if you're not just a random guy who then comes in and shouts at them over one thing or another, and then, you know, no, nothing's ever right or things are very difficult and they're not willing to work with you. So it makes yeah. makes sense that you would really want to uh, foster those relationships. So you... Um... You mentioned compliance a few times, and uh, yeah, uh, in this, that's might be one of the reasons a lot of people will go to China to get manufacturing done because the cost of compliance in the states or the regulations in the states is so astronomically high that they can just kind of bypass those rules and regs that are required in the states. You know, like workers can only work forty hours a week. You can't use this product. You can't use that product. Uh, different rules that apply in the states might not. Ex- apply in in the in china um but they kind of i mean like some some of the rules are important you know like don't put your toxic waste in the river does that yes does that still kind of i mean what are the working yeah. conditions like there Do, are they trying to avoid that kind of stuff and work on the global warming and all the problems yeah. we're having is are they kind but, of addressing it is it still wild west no, they, they, it's very much being addressed. Um, so, for example, um, when I talk about compliance, there's two types of compliances that we talk about. The one is product compliant. In other words, does the product meet all the requirements of the country it's being sold in, which I don't think anybody can really circumvent because no matter where it's made, if you're selling it in the U.S. and it's not compliant, the U.S. regulators are going to shut you down or – you know, penalize you or take it off the market if they catch you. And one thing I've learned is a competition are the biggest police out there. The they're, black gonna be, they're gonna be <laughs> yeah, yeah. The competition are gonna do a wonderful policing job. So like I always recommend people don't take shortcuts. Um of course especially if you're in the volume game and you've got a good brand out there and you're serious about business because the, the regulators don't need to catch you. Your competition need to catch you, and they're very vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Because <laughs> then they will report you. So product compliance is one thing. What you're talking about is kind of the factory compliance into kind of social standards and social regulations. It is becoming a big thing in China. So a lot of factories, um, in fact, a lot of big retailers that we work with now insist, which we're happy about, is that the factories are audited and pass all the social and ethical compliance standards. So there's a lot of standards like BSCI is an accreditation, um, SEDEX is an accreditation. So these factories actually have to be audited to those standards and get a certificate and certification to say that they follow the right work hours, follow the right working conditions, um, there's a lot around social ethical compliance and what we call the Modern Slavery Act. Um, it's it's a really a big deal now in China. Not all factories comply, but all large importers will only work with manufacturers who do comply. And they've got to succumb to audits. They've got to um, pay for those audits on their own. And if they're not audited, you know, then a big retailer will say, well, you've got to get audited first before we'll raise a purchase order on you. Now, 
I'm not finding that so much with smaller e-commerce buyers. I find they seem to still be a, a lot more product focused than um, having a focus on the social and ethical compliance of manufacturers. And I, and you know, what I find when I talk to them is it's a lot of sometimes lack of awareness. They didn't even know that was a thing they could ask for or have okay. a requirement for, um, or they just happy to say, well, is it a good factory? Have you checked it out? You know, do they have a certificate that they've been audited before? And okay, well, we're happy with that. We don't really want to go deep into um, into the details, how well it's done, if it's really implemented diligently. But that change is happening now. You know, um, we do a lot of business with international retailers. It's a massive, massive part of our business in Europe, in the US, and in Australia, and and in South Africa. And I'm talking like Walmart, Kmart, Target. Uh, massive companies and they will not touch the factory that isn't and they've got a whole um, QA quality assurance team of that you have to deal with they won't touch a factory that's not socially compliant which is a good thing I agree yeah, yeah no that's yeah. great well hey as we're starting to get sort of to the end of this conversation I wondered if maybe you could leave our listeners with just like kind of a quick maybe a top three or a top five rules for doing business in China we talked uh, talked a little bit about working on you know getting our trademarks filed and things like that but do you have a few more just sort of solid actionable insights that people can use so I think um, patience and grit Don't, <laughs> it's a long process be super patient <laughs> Um, though that's who survives, it, it, it's patience and grit. Um, you've got to, don't expect everything's going to be smooth sailing, expect the worst. Um, and just, if you ride through it, you will eventually get there. I think sampling, I think it's essential. You get samples of anything you're going to buy and don't judge prices or try and negotiate with factories until you've got samples of everything. Because I think there's a massive difference in how things are made, the quality of materials. So when you're trying to negotiate, just negotiating through email and not having touched or felt the product and not having clear specs on the product. You're not necessarily comparing apples with apples. Um, and yeah. And then just attention to detail. I think the, the, the devil's in the detail on these things and you can't leave anything to chance, take your time, document everything, spec everything, just pay a lot of attention to detail because it can go wrong in so many areas or so many elements and you just want to avoid that. The devil's really, really in the detail. It's not what they're telling you that you need to know. It's what they're not telling you that you need to figure out. I love that. Well, cool. That's a great place to wrap this thing up. So, David, where can people find out more about you, uh, you know, you personally, if that's what you want, or, or about your company, sure. Global TQM, or, um, sure. uh, or uh, sorry, the other one, Regency. <laughs> Global Regency. Global Regency. So, so, Whomever so, it is so you'd like got, people to reach. Well, I think Global TQM is the best way to reach out to us because Global TQM is built around helping people get their products launched and sourced in China and a lot of services around that, um, including the trademark stuff. So if they go to our website, globaltqm.com, mm -hmm. there's actually a free call button there. You can just schedule a free call. And what I do is like, um, I've got a, a couple of guys that take those calls and talk about the projects and we can discuss how we can help. It's always easier than trying to figure out what you need, just to have a quick conversation. And if they've heard this podcast and they want to talk to me personally, they can just schedule the call and put in the notes there. Um, I want to speak to David, where, you know, saw him on, on X podcast. And then I'll, I'll see that message and I'll take the call with pleasure. You know, I love talking to people and potential customers, so I'm happy to do that. And they free calls and you get loads of advice anyway. It's not a, I love talking to people. Sure, that's great. Yeah, no, I actually may have to give you a ring one of these days. I've got a, a product that uh, may require some manufacturing overseas, so uh, I may have to talk Excellent. to you about it. So cool. Well, thanks so much, David. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Uh, thanks to everybody tuning Likewise. in on the live stream and downloading the episode. Uh, you can always find us or interact with the show, eggscast.com. And uh, yeah, once again, our host, our uh, guest was David Hoffman from uh, Global or uh, yeah, Global TQM. So cool. Yep, well, thank, thank you. Thanks so much, David. Take care. Yep. See ya. Thanks, Scott. Thanks very much.